Welcome everyone to another episode of Keto Chat. I am your host, Carol Freeman, and I'm the creator of the Fast Track to Keto Success Program and certified nutritionist and clinical hypnotherapist. I am honored and privileged to be here today bringing you Dr. Keone, Keone Teddy. Oh my God, I totally screwed that up. Dr. <laughs> Keona, Keone Tita. Oh my God, say it for me. I can't even. Very good. Dr. Keone, how about that? Uh, we, we have connected um, both graduates of Bastyr University, and you're over on the other coast from me. Um, where, where are you at right now? North Carolina, Winston-Salem. Okay. Oh, all the way in the East Coast there. I hear you guys are starting to get your heat, right? Oh, Coastal? yes. Yeah, today yeah. was hot. Yes. Well, Dr. Keone, can you share with us, how did you get on the track that you're on? Actually, um, I want to start out. I forgot. I want to read. I get so excited to talk to you. I forgot to read your bio. Let's let me share with everyone uh, who you are, and then we'll dive into how you got to be okay. where you are. So, uh, Keone is a naturopathic physician and acupuncturist practicing at the Metabolic Effect Clinic in Winston Salem, North Carolina. He received his undergraduate degrees from North Carolina State University in chemical engineering and biochemistry and his graduate degree from North Carolina A&T University in environmental engineering. He attended medical school at Bastyr University. His passion is in the study and practice of exercise, nutrition, bone health, and longevity. He is a contributing writer for Natural Triad Magazine and the Townsend Letter for Doctors and Patients. Along with his brother, Jade, he's the founder of the online health and wellness company, Metabolic Effect, and author of the books, The Metabolic Effect Diet and Lose Weight Here. He's also a contributing author in the textbook of Natural Medicine, fourth edition. Welcome, welcome, Dr. Keone, after I totally screw up your name. So thank you. I'm glad you're here. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> How, you know, so your background is very different from medicine. I mean, biochemistry, it, it definitely sounds like you've got an interest in systems and how I'm just going to guess that you really love figuring out how the body works. Is that, is that what? Yes, indeed. And I guess my history with uh, working with people trying to lose weight goes way back to my personal training days. And um, so for years, um, I believed because it was ingrained in my head about the um, eat less, exercise more mantra. And that's the way I helped people get weight off. And it worked, at least in the short term. But in the long term, what happens is they rebound and they rebound and go over and beyond because the body just does not want to be in another state of stress like that of eating less and exercising more. That's a lot of stress. And what happens is it affects your weight thermostat. And over the years, I've learned that and seen that. And that's why you will rarely ever see pictures of the people on that show, The Biggest Loser, because they end up being the biggest gainer. So two years or two years out. And the research shows that, that people that go on diets eventually will gain all their weight back. And, and the more they go on diets, the more they will gain their weight back. And yeah. uh, so that's, th that's kind of my passion. Um, and, you know, as far as fat loss goes with longevity, um, I've come to the point where, yes, if you can get the excess visceral fat off somebody, not necessarily the subcutaneous fat off somebody, um, you can make them healthy, but I'm also, uh, and help them live a higher quality of life. But I also do believe very strongly that people who cannot drop that weight um, can make themselves very healthy also, even though they'd be considered or have a high BMI or a high fat percentage, which I've seen in my clinic many a times. So, so losing weight should not be the end all be all. It should be about making the person healthier in whatever way we can. So that, that's kind of in a nutshell what I do at my clinic. Oh, that's, that's fantastic. I love that. There is so much misunderstanding about visceral fat and, and uh, the subcutaneous fat, right? Because people are conditioned to think like if you can see somebody's fat, that means they're automatically healthy. And if somebody doesn't look fat, then then they're healthy. And I was just having this discussion this morning on a call with my clients. Uh, they, they, a lot of times they tell me like, well, my husband can eat whatever he wants. He doesn't have a weight problem. It's like, I would probably guess 90% chance that he's not as healthy as he thinks he is, even though he doesn't have that external fat that we can see. Right. Um, and I'd even go the other way. So there are, there are skinny people in our society who are, who are obese. So sarcopenic yeah. obesity is a real thing. And you also see that too. So measuring people by the way they look 
or how society measures them is, is not a true measure of health. So somebody who's overweight does not necessarily mean they're unhealthy. So what, um, so I'm guessing you've got, you know, lab markers you're looking at. So what are things that you look at to know whether somebody is actually healthy or not, independent of what they weigh? Yeah, that's a great question. So in, in our clinic, the, the tests that I run across the board for everybody, um, uh, just to get a baseline, and some of them are diagnostic, but I don't run them to diagnose them. I mean, some, if, if something comes up, I will definitely tell them. But the main test I run is a hemoglobin A1C, right? And most diabetics know what that one is, and that's a measure of your, your uh, blood sugar or average blood sugar uh, over the last three or four months. So if you get a hemoglobin A1C of five, your blood sugar is going to be about 90 or so. Once you get up to around six, you're at 120 or 130, okay? Um, and what I want to do is I don't want them just in the, the reference range. I want them to be optimal. So an optimal hemoglobin A1C for me, for my clients that I'd like them to work towards, is less than five without hypoglycemic symptoms. Okay. The next test I run is called a cardiac CRP or C-reactive protein or a high sensitivity C-reactive protein. That is one of my favorite inflammatory markers. So um, people with excess visceral fat in their body will tend to have an elevation of that and it's also a great marker of future heart attack risk so i put more weight in that test than i would into blood lipids and the optimal level is less than one for that most Mm -hmm. americans are about two to three um and then the next test i run after that is fasting insulin all right now insulin um is a great marker it's a growth so what insulin is is it's actually a a growth promoter. So a lot of bodybuilders will actually use insulin to help them build muscle, right? Because it helps them put on weight, helps them put on muscle. It's a locking and storing uh, type hormone. If you're working out a lot like a bodybuilder, you can use it to uh, put on muscle. You can also use it to cycle your carbs to help you with that if you're working out a lot. But what it does from a health perspective is it also is the higher it is, the higher at risk you are for promoting fertile ground for the growth of cancer, okay? Also, the higher it is, the higher risk you have for blood pressure. And blood pressure over time creates all, high blood pressure creates all kinds of problems. So the optimal level you want with insulin is less than three, in my opinion. Um, That's optimal. Most people run between like five and 12, with a, with a fasting insulin. But it's really interesting because the levels in range go from three all the way up until 25 on, a, on an actual doctor's lab. So that's, that's, the, uh, that's number three. And then number four, I like to run a homocysteine test. I consider that another anti-inflammatory uh, test, but it's beyond that because it also tells you a little bit about your B vitamin status. It also, I, I really like it because it also tells you how well or optimal your biochemical processes are working and how well you are methylated. A lot of your biochemical processes require methyl groups to run optimally. So for example, if you have a tumor suppressor gene that's not methylated appropriately, that's a problem, you know, and homocysteine gives you an indirect measure of health status. It's also, most people know about homocysteine as having a relationship with future heart attack risk to or a future cardiovascular event. And then the last one that I really like to run is vitamin D. So any conventional doc will know what all those are. They won't necessarily run it on people that are not diabetic or have cardiovascular disease, but I recommend all my patients run it because it's a way to optimize your health. And once you get the baseline, then you work to do things to optimize it. So. All right. Well, okay. So, um, I wanted to ask too about, you know, back as your, your days as a personal trainer when you were, you know, a staunch promoter like everyone was of just eat less and exercise more. Um, when you would see people gain the weight back, um, did you fall into kind of that traditional mindset of like, well, they just got lazy, they stopped working out, they, they yeah. um, you know, it was their fault. Did you, yes. did you is that how you thought before? Oh, absolutely. You know, here, here, here is my, my thing. Um, you know, I, I would consider it a big regret with what personal trainers do, nutritionists, physicians that are still in that mindset. 
I mean, anybody who's still putting people, like I was telling you before, on an eat less, exercise more regimen and telling them that's the way to lose weight, um, I, I think at this point is unethical. The research doesn't support. In fact, there's tons of research out there that shows that it does just the opposite. It causes, mm -hmm. it causes weight gain. But what we have is we, we've kind of all been brainwashed with that, you know, and, and, and not only have we been brainwashed with that, we think the only ways to go to lose weight and to be healthy is to eat less and exercise more. Yeah. And all it does is it puts your body into thinking that it's starving and then your body becomes more efficient at storing fat over time. So you will become heavier and, um, and, and you'll have more fat storage. And then, so what do we do, right? What do most people do? We think, well, you know, my client, they're just not good enough, right? And we tell ourselves that, the people that are on that, I'm not good enough, I don't have the willpower to do it. And um, really what it is, is evolution has primed our bodies to get as many calories as we can and to do it with the least amount of exertion that we can. Okay, so that's what evolution has done for us. And, it, and that's why we're here. But now in these days, we have sugar on every corner, it doesn't work so well. So most of us are gaining gaining weight and and an interesting fact is this weight gain phenomenon we're not just seeing in humans we're seeing in our pets mm, we're, yes. we're, even, we're even seeing it in lab animals think how crazy that is that those are controlled environments and we're even seeing it in wild animals so that goes into a whole another thing why this weight gain phenomenon is is going on because then there's other things that that probably can out be out there causing it like, like environmental toxicants maybe maybe part of the role but getting back to your question, I, I, you know, if I had a regret in, in life with the thousands of clients I've seen, I'd want to say, look, I'm sorry to each one of you because I've put you on an exercise more, eat, you know, eat less type thing. All I did was make your body more efficient at gaining fat. And that's what I was taught. But the problem, yeah. everybody was, everybody was saying that and people are still saying that. So it's a big problem. So one of the biggest causes of weight gain in our society is just that, going on the stereotypical diet, eat less, exercise more. Yeah, well, so, and that's exactly what I came out of school believing and, and promoting in my own practice as a nutritionist was, you know, don't go on diets. It's just going to make you gain more weight in the long term. So just right. love yourself the way that you are, um, eat yeah. mindfully, eat intuitively, um, you know, don't label foods as good or bad, just eat them and joy joyously. And so I would, you know, eat a piece of chocolate cake, enjoying every single bite with no guilt and all the while <laughs> continuing to gain weight and be in denial that I was getting more and more unhealthy. Um, so, yeah. so what's the option? Like, do we just all get fat and sick or, or, you know, is, is there hope for, uh, hope well, for and, and that, yes. Yeah, so there, there is hope and, and, let me get a little bit into that, but it, it's very interesting to me. And here's where the hope kind of lies. And you can think about it as two, two toggles between two ways of eating, talking specifically about diet and exercise. So, so there's two ways to lose, to lose weight, which is with, with when we're talking purely of calorie, bur uh, taking in calories and burning calories. Okay. So there's two ways. The first way is eat less, exercise less. Okay. And that's what our great grandparents did. All okay. right. Yeah. And what I mean by eat less and exercise less, I'm not talking about our great grandparents didn't necessarily exercise. Like we're talking about the turn of the 20th century, right? End of the, the 19th century. What they did was, is they stayed active. So they were active. And what we find throughout the, the past and decades going way back that we're getting more and more sedentary in our, in our lifestyles. So eat less, exercise less is one way to help. All right. And then the other way, is to eat more and exercise more. So let's think about uh, Michael Phelps, the Olympic swimmer, right? When he's in training, he's eating about 7,000 calories per day. If I put him on an eat less, exercise more type of thing for him to go do his Olympics, he would fail miserably. Yeah. I don't care how, how great he is. He cannot sustain himself on a diet like that. He'd lose muscle, and over time, he'd start putting on fat. So, so people can think in their lifestyles like, okay, when the holiday season comes around, instead of waiting till January 1st, I know I'm going to be eating more. Well, why don't I just make sure I'm moving more too? 
during that day. So that's when I want to get my Fitbit out or whatever and walk more. And that's when I want to do my intense workouts. And then during the stressful times of the week where you can't get to the gym or you have to take care of your kids or you have to, you know, you have a lot of stuff where you just can't work out. Instead of sitting at your desk all day, maybe stand or maybe get up and move, you know, do, do what you can park at the end of the parking lot of a, a food store. So those are two ways to, to help yourself because really what we're ultimately doing this is what I tell my, my clients is what we want to do is we want to make, you know, your hunger centers in your brain resistant to gaining weight. That's the ultimate thing we want to do. And that's where obesity starts, weight gain starts, all starts in your head. And that's where your hunger centers are. So by staying active, whether you exercise consistently or move a lot, um, what that makes is that makes your weight thermostat more resistant to weight gain. So people who are constantly moving and doing something during the day, they just are not as prone to that decades, you know, 10 pound weight gain, they're at a new weight thermostat every decade, you know, and you keep gaining and gaining. It just does not happen as readily to them. So that's one, that's one way to do it. Just thinking about diet and exercise alone, but there's a lot of other ways to do it um, that, that we can certainly do. And, and, and I'm really into, we can, maybe we could talk about it later or now, but I'm really into environmental food cues and knowing having people realize what are the things that we do mindlessly also. So, so uh, do you want to talk about that now? Um, yeah. Yeah. Let's okay. talk. Well, yeah, let's talk about, you know, what are the, um, this, you know, what are the keys to, to sustainable fat loss? So let's okay, just. Start- so, this, so this is a big key then. This is yeah. a big key for my clients. Uh, people really need to think about what their food environment is like. All right. And so let me give you an example. So some really incredible books out there. Um, one is called Mindless Eating by Brian Wansick. And the other one is called Slim by Design by Brian Wansick. And he's a PhD at a Cornell University. He's a nutritionist. But what he did was he went into thousands of American homes all over the country. And what he wanted to do is he wanted to compare normal weight people compared to people that have a weight problem. And what he found was the people who tend to have a weight problem tended to leave food on the counter. So, for example, and he even got specific about it. So he even said, okay, somebody puts soda on the counter and he looked at soda compared to an to somebody who's normal weight, that overweight person or that person who does that is going to be about 29 pounds overweight by leaving soda out, of, out on the counter, hmm. right? So one of my weight loss mantras or techniques I use for my people because they can just say it in their head is out of sight, out of mind, out of reach, out of stomach, okay? And so what I mean by that, so out of sight, out of mind, out of reach, out of stomach. Mm-hmm. What I mean by that is if you're leaving food on the counter, all right, and you come in and constantly see it unconsciously, that's getting your cephalic insulin rise going, seeing it, it's going to make you want to eat, you start losing willpower, well, you've already lost it from a hard day's work, and you come in, you're going to want to snack that, Mm -hmm. so he looked at a number of foods, he looked at diet soda, diet soda, 21 pounds overweight compared to somebody who doesn't leave it out on the counter, Mm -hmm. crackers, I think was nine pounds overweight, Cereal, I think, was 24 pounds overweight if you store the food. So just storing the food away when you can't see it is a trick that everybody can do that will help them tremendously. So you went even further. So when you open your cabinets and the first thing you see are your comfort foods or, or, or um, junk foods. So for me, one of, my, one of my comfort foods is chocolate and chips, right? So if I have chips in the house and I go into my counter, my cabinet and it's on that shelf at eye level, I will go through that bag of chips in probably a couple days. If I put it on the top shelf, hidden behind something, I know it's there consciously, but if I put it up there, I'm going to go through it in about two weeks, maybe a month. Sometimes I'll even forget about it. So if we think about how our brain works and from an evolutionary perspective, we want to consume as many calories, putting the least amount of energy into it, Right. So you want to make it difficult in your food environment for you to obtain your comfort foods or junk foods. Doesn't mean you can't have that or it shouldn't be there. But again, if you, if you make sure that every time you get junk food, you're going to be a lot less likely to eat it when you, if you have to get in your car to go get it than if it's in your house somewhere. Right. Okay. Or you're going to be a lot less likely to eat it if you have to reach up as opposed to just, you know, going in there and uh, opening your cabinets at eye level or your refrigerator. So yeah, are- I, I use that strategy also to uh, advantage with my clients. So I teach them 
to make all their, you know, keto friendly foods fast and easy as well. I want those to be the easiest ones for them to grab. So yeah, even go so far as buying pre-sliced cheese, um, you know, sliced, sliced meats and things like that. So it's, and it, you know, even hard boiled eggs that are pre hard boiled, just if that's easier to get and grab, then like you said, the chips that are on the back and the back of the cupboard because their husband or wife or kids have to have those foods in the house still, then, then that's going to make it more sustainable for them because that's easier to do than the, the other. Yeah, that's right. And here, here's another fascinating thing about some of these studies. So he, he, him and his colleagues even went into restaurants. So he went into buffets. He wanted to see how people are that are overweight. What do they do mindlessly compared to people that lead up buffets that are, that are underweight? Or, or normal weight, I should say, not underweight. But what he found was people will go to the buffet, they'll, especially if they're overweight, they go straight to the buffet, they usually pick up the largest plate, and they go down the line, right? And they just put, you know, whatever, whatever they find appealing on their plate, they tend to choose, you know, fatty, salty, sugary stuff, like we all do, you know, <laughs> but they tend to choose a lot of that, and they'll fill that plate up. Then they go to their seat, and they tend to sit within 16 feet of the buffet, and they tend to face it. Okay. So this is fascinating stuff where somebody who's underweight will go to that buffet. They tend to pick up a smaller plate. They'll scan the buffet before they even go in there. And then they, they choose a few foods. They don't have a whole lot of variety on their plate. Research on variety is fascinating. The more variety you have to choose from, the more you'll eat. Um, and then they walk away from the buffet. They tend to sit with their back to it and they're a more than 16 feet away by a window. And if they have the option to use chopsticks, the normal weight people use chopsticks where the overweight people don't, they tend to use forks. So it's just mindless stuff that is fascinating, mm -hmm. you know, now they, and also, you know, normal weight people will tend not to do the liquid calories and all the other stuff that me and you, you know about, but the other stuff is very mindless stuff that we don't think about that plays a huge, huge role in yeah. helping us maintain our weight. So I tell people, think about your food environment in your house and how to set that up to make it, uh, you know, more difficult to obtain and get those foods and stuff like that. Yeah, that's great. Yeah. So um, let's talk about, um, oh gosh, so many things we need to talk about. Uh, and talk about how that, um, you know, how you look at cravings. How do you, I mean, I imagine well, this strategy you're talking about also reduces cravings, but what other things do you have that? All right. So I want to bring up another fascinating study about cravings. This blew me away when I saw it and it's just fascinating to me. So this guy is out of, what's his name? I think his name is Dr. Cabignac. I, I, I don't know. I, I my friend is probably, I probably ruined his name, but he's, he's a French guy out of Laval university. Okay. In, in Canada, what he found was he took two groups of people. He took a group of people that were obese and then he took a normal weight group of people. Okay. And what he did is he had them in laboratory settings. All right. And he fed them a bland foods diet. Okay. And it was like a bland food smoothies and he had the correct number of macronutrients in there. So it had all the, you know, the, the carbs you want, the fat, the protein had the micronutrients in there. It just didn't taste great. You know, it wasn't like a sugary, salty, thing and what he found was the people that were overweight automatically lowered their calories to starvation levels automatically they could eat as much as they wanted this stuff but automatically did it and guess what their body didn't push back against them they were satisfied on this diet they didn't want to eat anymore whereas the normal weight people still ate their normal caloric load of 2000 calories all right so that blows me away because that tells me that tells me that Tasty foods make you overeat, of course, right? Mm -hmm. But if you can move people more, so how can you use that in real life? If you can take people and move them more to a whole foods diet and get them away from a junk foods diet, which tends to be more sugary, salty, and fatty, and that type of thing, you're going to automatically move them to a more bland foods diet. So yeah. people who tend to eat more of a whole foods diet automatically – tend to eat more of a blander diet and they can regulate their weight better than somebody who eats more of a fast food junk foods diet yeah. and, you won't get, and you won't get the pushback on that. All right. Now here's another fact. Now the second part of that study was he took the, he took another group of people. See if I, I'm doing this from memory. So see if I get this right. But anyway, he, he, the, the, the people that were overweight or had a, had a weight issue 
he had two groups of them, right? So he had two groups of people that had weight issues and one group he fed a bland foods diet to, okay? And the other group, he just lowered their calories and let them eat whatever they wanted. So the bland foods diet group automatically lowered their calories again to like really low levels without any metabolic pushback on their body, which fascinates me. And they lost weight like you wouldn't believe. And then the people who were put on this, put on a low calorie diet, what happened was they, they, they're, they were miserable, right? What happens when your body thinks it's starving? I mean, these people were dreaming of food at night. They were craving, their cravings were out of control. And when they came off the diet, they rebounded their weight set point. They rebounded back and above what they originally had. Whereas the other people on this more of a bland foods diet stayed, stayed, um, satiated and lost a tremendous amount of weight. So that says a lot about cravings. So the cravings happen in your brain. So taste, food textures, that all plays a role. And then, you know, now, it's a, you know, to your clients and to my patients and clients, you know, you know, them saying, well, you know, Dr. Tita or Carol's put me on a bland foods diet. That's awful. But you really have to think about it as relative to, to what a junk foods diet is, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Well, and nobody... <laughs> Nobody's going to sign up for a bland food diet, right? Like that's not <laughs> sexy. Nobody's buying that. But, right. you know, I found the way, you know, ways around that is just creating some other rules and explaining it in a different way. You know, eat food that doesn't taste very good. Like that doesn't, no. nobody wants to follow that. But I, you know, I have a, a starter phase that I have people go through. And one of the rules is uh, no sweeteners of any kind, not even any of the, the keto friendly, sugar free stuff. Um, yeah. Because, you know, I, I, I tell them that's working, you know, re resetting taste buds, which it is, because, um, uh, you know, you take a break from that and then a little bit of sweet goes a long way. You don't need nearly as much. Um, also, it removes the ability to have that combo of fat and sweet together, which automatically it makes us eat more. Um, so yeah. it's one of the mistakes I see people do trying to do keto on their own is they're trying to make all these keto desserts and, you know, fat bombs and, and trying to recreate their former high carb life in a keto friendly manner. And then they're wondering why they're not losing any weight because um, they're yeah. still overeating, even though they're, they're, you know, following this low carb plan. And so that's one of the ways that I incorporate that is that it, it, it does make it more bland to not have sweetness with it, but I don't tell them. I don't tell them they're going to have a bland diet. They're just going to have, they are going to have one, but we well, tell it differently. I don't know. Are you familiar with uh, Dr. Uh, Stephen Guillen? Uh, yeah, yes, yes. He, yes. His, um, his whole eating plan is based on that like bland foods approach, which, um, yeah. you know, works yeah. well, but you got to, you got to, you got to sell it differently. <laughs> yeah, and yes. It, it definitely has, to, it definitely has to be sold differently, but um you know, it's, it, and, and you are right. So when we look at, when we look at the, the science on what are the most satiating foods, we can go from there to help people move more towards a diet that's going to help stabilize their weight. And one, the least satiating food combos is sugar and fat together or mm -hmm. carb and fat together. Great. That does not satiate very well. The most satiating this, and this fascinates because a lot of people can't believe this, but the most satiating food that I think that has been tested is a white baked potato. That's oh, the yeah. food. And that, that's fascinating to me because people are like, oh, you know, there's a lot of carb in there. Yeah, there is, but there's other aspects of that potato. So when you eat wet carbs over dry carbs, it's much more satiating. Yeah. When you add fat to that potato or salt it, you're going to eat more of it. When you fry it, you're going to eat more of it. But a yeah. plain baked potato is very satiating for people who do not want to go on a low carb or no carb diet. That's very satiating. And then after that, then you think about other combos like proteins, very satiating protein fat combos are satiating um, where you're eating fiber and water combos are very satiating. So soups and salads before meals can help control, control that, that hunger also. But, you know, here again, it's like that, that sweet taste, we have evolved to want that sweet taste. And unfortunately, mm -hmm. it's everywhere around us. So when you give that sweet, whether it's in the form of real sweet, like glucose, or diet sweet, as in diet soda sweeteners, or, or whatever, you still it, it can it can bite you in the long run and make you eat more later on. Hence the studies of leaving diet soda out on the counter, right? There's no calories in diet sodas, but yet people that drink diet sodas, you know, um, overall based on those studies tend to be overweight. Now, which came first, you know, I don't, I, I'm not sure, but we do know that just the taste of sweet can make you have cravings later on. Yeah. Whether and there, there is research actually that shows that most of the sweeteners that they, 
they use in most diet sodas actually cause an insulin response. And, right. and so, I mean, that makes sense from a hormonal aspect that, you know, anytime you're going to get that insulin response, you're going to, your body's going to be promoting fat storage or at least locking up what it's already got in there. So, so speaking of hormones, let's talk about, you know, how do hormones come into play into fat loss? Like it, it moving away from the whole, you know, if it's just about calories or it's not about calories and exercising, what's, what's going on behind the scenes? What's, what, what do hormones well, have to do with it? So, so hormones, hormones play a big role in it. Okay. And, and I, I used to be that it's all about the hormones and it's not necessarily all about the hormones. However, they are the things, the metabolic messengers that signal your brain about what's going on in your environment and stuff like that. But I, I think an, an easy, uh, I think the, uh, the hormones to worry about mainly are going to be insulin, cortisol, and leptin. And so just real simply, insulin is a locking and storing hormone. So if you're eating a high calorie diet and or a high carb diet, they, those two tend to go hand in hand, but it doesn't have to be. If you're just eating protein all day, you can still get a big insulin response off protein. Hence, a lot of people doing the keto diet, right? If they're eating too much protein, they need to lower it because they're probably getting some sugar, sugar from all the protein if they're eating too much. But anyway, insulin is a is a big one. That's why I test for it, right? So we want you we want your body to be insulin sensitive. As you eat more calories, eat more carbs, you can over time become insulin resistant, where your body no longer hears that signal. And if it doesn't hear that signal, then your hunger centers, that signal goes to your hunger centers, it will disrupt you and make you want to eat more than you normally would. Um, the other hormone that is a big, big problem for people is stress hormone. And we all deal with stress um, on a daily basis. The, the problem is, is most people don't have very good healthy ways of manage, managing it so that your body doesn't perceive your stressors as ph physiologically damaging to your, to your body, right? And so if, if cortisol is, stays elevated long, that's also going to give you a sugar surge from your, from your liver. So a lot of people who, who you know, have been eating Atkins or been eating keto and tend to have high insulin levels or whatever, it may just be, you know, it may just be the, the stress hormone that's causing those sugar levels, levels to be up there. Mm -hmm. So that's, and dieting will actually help elevate cortisol if you're doing it the wrong way, right? If you're doing the eat less, exercise more thing. And not only that, when you are eating a high calorie diet and you have that stress hormone, stress hormone cortisol causes you to build, put it, build more visceral fat. All right. And more visceral fat. And this is where I think a lot of our problems come from health, but not only the fat gain phenomenon, but also the chronic disease issues that we have. Visceral fat just pumps out inflammatory metabolic messengers non-stop i mean it just goes non-stop and it will hit your hunger centers and completely disrupt it so that you're going to be more likely to eat more you're going to sleep less which is going to make you eat more um you're, you're not going to make very good choices which is going to make you eat more and you're going to store more visceral fat you're going to have more inflammation but also that fat talking about the third hormone that fat um, also will secrete leptin. All your, all your fat cells will secrete a hormone called leptin. And that is really the main hormone that will tell your brain to shut off eating. And, and if you're constantly putting on fat and you're constantly getting surges of leptin, you can become leptin resistant where then what happens? Then all of a sudden that your brain doesn't hear that signal to stop eating anymore. And, and you'll keep eating. So those, so those are, so those are the, main, the main hormones without, get, without getting too much into the biochemistry. Um, so what, so what, can you, what can you do about that? You know, how, how do you offset that? And um, I think one of the biggest ways, and this goes back again to diet and exercise, but do it in a way that is doable for you, you know? And I like to make a distinction between exercise and movement because for a lot of people, I think exercise is just another added stress to their life, okay? Mm -hmm. It's like another thing they have to do during their day, and if they can only do it for two weeks at a time and then they take three months off because they're so exhausted, then it's another stress in your life. So the main thing is I want people to do is move, all right? So research shows 
there's something out there called NEAT, right? It's the acronym for non-exercise um, activity thermogenesis, right? That's all the movement other than exercise that we do during the day. If people just stay active, do other than exercise where they stand at their desk or they get up and move, they're doing the dishes, they're cleaning their car, they're cleaning house, they're, they're running errands, they're parking at the back of a parking lot before they walk into the food store. What that shows is that will actually help normalize hormones and they're actually getting a lot more activity in than somebody who, like me on some days, will sit at a desk for like eight hours. I work out pretty consistently, but what the research shows, somebody like me or somebody who works out every day but sits at a desk for seven hours or eight hours a day is more unhealthy than somebody who doesn't exercise but just moves mostly, whether they're overweight or not, whether they're overweight or not. You know, so, so this whole phenomenon of somebody being overweight and being unhealthy is not necessarily true. You know, it's, you can be overweight and, and, and be healthy, okay? And that's my main goal with my clients. I just want their, their health to get better, and I do it with those lab markers and some other things. And then usually that weight will start coming down, and they feel more in line to where – that willpower battery's not drained and they're not snacking and they're, and they're, they're more mindful of what they're doing. Yeah. Well, that's, that's a key thing that you said, such a big difference in, you know, what most people have heard when they go to the doctor, most people are told lose the weight and then you'll get healthier, Uh, lose the weight and then your blood pressure will come down, lose the weight and, and the pain will go away. But it actually, um, it sounds like you agree with my perspective with what I've seen is that, you start getting them healthier and then the weight comes off. <laughs> right. Yes. And, and not only that, if you put them on an exercise, more eat less type phenomenon, which most doctors do because they don't know any better. And I did for years. Um, I was just as guilty as that. You're making them more unhealthy. You're making them more unhealthy later on. And you're making them, you're making them efficient at putting on fat. And not only that, and this is a, this is a huge problem, especially for young women in our society, because I have a number of women who based on societal standards, consider themselves overweight, but really aren't overweight, and they're, be, and they're going on diets. Or I have overweight teenagers going on diets, and that is setting them up for big problems later on. Big problems. And, and the re- dieting with people that are normal weight, people that have, don't really have a weight issue, but go on a diet anyway, dieting is worse for them than somebody who's already overweight and going on a diet. So if you are underweight or normal weight and go on a diet, that's a problem. And a lot of people do it because no, you know, a lot of people, especially men men too, but women are really known for this in our society, you know, based on the magazines and the media are, you know, just not satisfied with the way they look. I mean, and everybody can relate to that, right? Well, you know, I wish I had this or I wish I had that. Instead of an ab, I wish I had abs, you know, that type of thing. (laughs) Yeah. that, That leads to, to this whole dieting phenomenon, which makes a makes is problematic later on in life. Yeah, I, I run into that as well. Um, that you know, there, there's people. Um, you know, when I go speak at conferences or something, there'll people that come up to me and they're like, you know, visibly underweight, and they're telling me that I tried keto and it didn't work for me. Like, what was I doing wrong? And it's like, right. what? Why were you trying a keto diet? What was your goal? Well, because I heard it's so good for your health. I want the magic. You know, I want to, I want to do that too. And, and it's like, it's a stressor on the body. And if you, unless you have epilepsy or brain cancer or, you know, dementia or some other thing, specific thing that you're treating with it, or you're, and you're not overweight, it's very, very stressful in the body. And those people don't need that extreme medical therapeutic diet to follow. Um, you know, just cutting out the sugar out of their diet is probably going to be as, you know, and, and yeah. white flour, they're going to probably get as many health benefits. And so, and, that- and I, I think you, you hit it on. I mean, uh, I, I, I love the ketogenic diet and it is part of my therapeutic order for getting people to get weight off. And I do believe, I, I don't think the science is there yet, but I think with everything we've been talking about, I do think the ketogenic diet, when you're on it, will make you more resistant for that weight thermostat to go up. You know, it makes you more resistant. And, and the issue, and you've probably seen this also with the ketogenic diet, I mean, uh, the, you know, most people are in the almost keto state, and that's why they think it's so bad. I think once you get into ketosis, you start feeling a lot better in my experience with my clients. And then it seems to be easier. And once you're in that state, now your brain is like, ah, you know, that stress is almost lifted off of them. 
like get, being in almost the not getting quite the ketosis mm-hmm. is, is problematic because I think you do it, it it can be a stressor and and people don't test correctly also they're not yeah. really good about it. they just hear about it, well I'm just going to eat a high fat diet without really talking to somebody about how to walk you through that and and test to make sure you're really where you are where you need to be with that yeah I run into the you know the people that tell me they're I'm following a keto diet or a, I'm doing keto ish. Yeah, and I put them in what I call the carb no man's land, right? Like you need enough carbs to fuel your body, or you need to keep them low enough to get to ketosis. But if you're in the middle, like that's misery right there, because it's just not enough to fuel you, and it's not low enough to. Yeah, it is. It is misery, and people. I just tell people they they really should have some guidance with it, like and and test appropriately to make sure they know what they're doing if they're going to go there. But but before I even get to my clients on ketosis or, or even recommend the ketogenic diet. Um, I'll, you know, there's so many other things you can do first, right? So for example, if, if, you know, if somebody tends to be anemic, they're not oxygenating their tissues. They're not going to be a great fat burner. That needs to be taken care of before you consider ketosis. If you, if you are snoring at night and waking up every tired all the time, just getting a CPAP makes your body a more efficient fat burner, you know? That, like it's it's like rule out the medical stuff look at the medications you're on i mean last time i looked i mean i'm i'm just guessing here but it's like four out of five medications seem to promote weight gain or at least don't allow you to lose weight you know so it's like manipulating that um lower in inflammation you know those things can help and then you know when you when you tried everything ketosis is one of those things in my, I mean, the ketogenic diet is one of those things in my therapeutic order where it's, it's way before uh, any type of bariatric surgery, of course, and it's way before any pharmaceutical intervention or weight loss drug that that should be, be tried if you're purely doing it to, to help with weight. And then once you do it a few times, you become better at it and then you can, you, then you can be on your own. But in general, I just tell people get the guidance. Have somebody like yourself, or you know, or or myself, to just help you walk you through it, and and so you don't hit the pitfalls that a lot of people do. That a lot yeah. of people. You you've mentioned a couple times your your therapeutic order. Do you mind sharing what that is? It sounds like it's a you know progression yeah. of. Is it is it try this first, and if that doesn't work, then move on. Yeah, to the next I, I can take you through it. I mean, typically when somebody comes to me for. Um, for uh, weight loss, we go through their history. And so what I want to do is I, I will first look at calories do matter. So I want to look at the, I mean, if you're on a ketogenic diet and, and you are, this is the thing I love about a ketogenic diet, it self-regulates calories too. So, you know, you, it's hard to overdo the calories once you're in ketosis, but you can. And if you do, you may not lose weight there, but it's hard because I, it tricks the brain into thinking you're satisfied. Mm-hmm. But before they even get there, um, strictly with, with fat loss, a client coming in for fat loss, I will look at their, I will look at their basal beta, metabolic rate. And in general, I will say, okay, this is your basal metabolic rate is, is 2000. Let's say it's 2000 or I don't know what we'll say. We'll say 2,500. Okay. I will say that is your, you know, that is your upper level caloric load. All right. So now I don't want you to count calories, but that should be your upper level. I don't want you to go too low, too far below that, but I don't want you to go too much above that. All right. Um, and then see how they do with that and see if that's like too much or if that's easy for them to do and see if they're losing weight off of that. If they're not, then I play with their macros, you know, and again, a lot of this is mix and matching. And the main macro I'll use is I will make sure that they get their protein level, get their protein level up and usually lower their carb level. Okay. Mm-hmm. Um, and so protein, it can be, and it depends on the person. It can be protein one gram per pound of body weight or one gram per pound of lean mass. It just depends on the person, depends on how active they are. And usually that will, that will take care of that. And then you think about that. So somebody who is, you know, um, uh, I don't know, getting protein in at, you know, maybe try to get 100 grams in a, a day, you know, again, as your caloric load, or we'll say 200 grams a day. For somebody like me, it'd be like 200 grams a day. You're going to say that that's going to be 800 calories of protein a day. All right. Okay. And then from there, then you can adjust the other macros. All right. And everybody, everybody's a little bit different, but protein is key because it's very satiating. 
for them. Then, then the next thing down is then we start talking about exercise. We talk about the whole movement versus exercise. So what can you do to maintain movement in your life? All right. And if you're really motivated, what can you do to exercise also? But movement, movement is key. Then in conjunction with that, we're looking at, we're doing testing to see what uh, medical conditions may be inhibiting their weight loss. So anemia can, um, sleep apnea definitely will. Um, uh, and then we look at also their drugs. And then part of that therapeutic order, then we go to sleep. Okay. If people aren't sleeping, what does that cause? It's going to cause them to overeat, right? Um, if they don't sleep well enough, they're not going to have enough energy in their brain centers or willpower battery to be mindful of things. So they're unconsciously going to be, be uh, um, you know, kind of a slave to food cues and things like that. So one of the big things I find with sleep is getting people, you know, to shut off their electronic equipment at night. You know, um, don't even get on the screens. Do something else. Read, but don't don't read on a computer because a lot of people that can that can mess them up. So we'll do things there, nutraceutical intervention. And now let's say they they've we've done all of that stuff. We got the exercise. We looked at sleep. We looked at metal conditions. We looked at drugs and everything, and they've given it a good go. Now I'm going to start talking about the keto diet. Now I'm going to say, you know what? Um, and, I, and also I do think like people who have, who have tried every diet out there in the book um, tend to do best on the keto diet. They, they just, they tend to do it because they, they've been, they've had it in their head for years, eat less, exercise more. Mm -hmm. um, and the keto diet kind of throws all that out the window where you're talking about a high fat diet. And you know, as long as they can get past that psychologically, <laughs> they can do that and we walk them through it, then I would go there. Now, usually that's the last stage, and most people don't even get to the keto diet. We've, we've taken care of the problems way up here, okay? Mm -hmm. um, we, and, and, and way up there, we talk about those food cues too, okay? Just so you know, that's in my therapeutic order also. But usually, so when they get to the keto diet, that's usually it. Now, with that, now I may start talking about nutraceutical intervention, okay? And so one of my favorite nutraceutical weight loss supplements, and this is going to be, this isn't sexy, but it's fiber and, okay. <laughs> <laughs> and, and also gut health, you know, restoring their gut health. Okay. Like that. So let's say we get all that done now and they're still having struggles and issues and they need something to spark the weight loss. I'm not against weight loss medications, but it is way down on my therapeutic order. And, and for some people, Again, you weigh the advantages and disadvantages of the weight gain and what their health is like. I'm not against then if that if that doesn't work or that is not sustainable and those drugs have to be done with a healthy lifestyle. They're not magic bullets or anything like that. Same with all the nutraceuticals. And if that doesn't work, then I will go to bariatric surgery. I will recommend that. But again, I've rarely gotten there. And, you know, it's it's one of those things where you go from the least invasive approach down to the most uh, you know, the most invasive approach and bariatric surgery is usually the, the most invasive because bariatric surgery, it's, it's funny in the research, it's shown certain procedures, they will lower your weight thermostat and it does have some good results, but the, the rates of death from the surgery are so high. Most people, if they knew probably wouldn't want to do that anyway, you know, but again, it's a give or take, you know, where are the people in their health? So that's the ba That's the therapeutic order in a nutshell with weight alone you know, diet and exercise. Well, and I, I love that you've instilled all these other changes and habits in them before they even get there, because I think that's one of the reasons there's actually, there's actually, uh, you know, from numbers that I've looked at two years after any weight loss surgery, most people have gained all the weight back. So it only lasts for two years, but it's because they don't address the psychological stuff, the food cues. They don't address the lifestyle things that really. Yeah, you're absolutely right. You're absolutely right. They have to address that other stuff else. You will gain the weight back no matter what diet you are, no matter what diet you're on. And that, that speaks to the fact about creating habits. And the other thing I tell my patients, a lot of people have heard, you know, that, um, well, here, here's what the research says about habits from what I understand. You know, if you, if you try to take on, if you try to make a healthy change in habits and you take on, more than three habits, you're probably going to fail. Hmm. You know, if you take on one thing that you know you can do, you can make a habit out of it where it becomes unconscious after a while and you don't even have to think about it. So, you know, if you're a soda drinker and you make, and you can make that change, not drinking soda, 
you know, the minimum it's going to take for you to make that change is 21 days, three weeks to, to where it becomes mindless. But most people, it takes close to a year to create a habit. That's what the research shows. Hmm. And I think sometimes people take on too much. So if we can make one small change, and now we're talking about health, I'm not t- necessarily talking about weight. I'm talking about, you know, get, uh, I want you to be healthy. And if you can make that change, you're automatically being healthy. And I can show you objective measures that you are, that weight will come off. But creating smart habits is, is really key for a lot of people. And part of those smart habits is your food environment, knowing what it is and knowing how to change it. Yeah. I want to ask, um, going back to the hormones, um, let's talk about middle-aged women and their hormonal challenges because that's, you know, I've, I've noticed with all the people that I've worked with, there's several things that contribute to how easy or how hard it is for somebody to lose weight. Like, so the, people have this fantasy that a keto diet, I'm going to lose 30 pounds overnight. And then when they don't get that kind of results, then they go, I must be doing it wrong or it won't work for me. And I found, you know, one of the many factors that slows things down is that the older women are, the harder it is for them to lose weight easily. And I, I, I'm attributing that to our hormones. And so how do you, how do you support that? How do you evaluate that? And um, yeah. Um, so unfortunately women do tend to have a little bit more difficult time losing weight than men. But as we age, there is such thing called age related weight gain. And we all have that, but to become resistant to that, where it's not a big problem again, and it helps your weight thermostat become resistant to weight gain is I really want the older we get, the more important I think it is to do resistance training. Okay. Mm-hmm. So that's one thing because I think it will help bounce their hormones and, and women know, I mean, yes, estrogen, um, is one of those hormones that helps give women that hourglass shape, um, gives them the female form. And when you go low on that, you're more prone, you're more prone to, uh, to gain weight. However, with, a, with appropriate sleep and lifestyle changes with the exercise, I, I really, the resist training, that can help tremendously to get them back, back online. All right. Now, I'm not, again, it's part of my therapeutic order. If women are going through, through menopause and they're just having a horrible time with it and they're not sleeping and they're having hot flashes and you've tried everything, like I just finished a study with acupuncture and hot flashes, which was really, really good. But let's say you even tried acupuncture and it didn't help take your hot flashes away. I'm not against hormone replacement therapy if, if that would help. But again, there's so many things that you, that you can do with diet alone and exercise, um, you know, carb- carbohydrates, uh, when we talk about hormones and, and the therapeutic order with hormones, the biggest ones to work, look at, no matter what age you are across the board are going to be insulin, leptin, um, you know, cortisol first and, uh, estrogen and progesterone do, pl- do play a role in that. But, but at first you get those in order first, and then you can adjust the estrogen and progesterone levels to help, help a woman maintain weight, you know, but again, to, for me to sit here and say, are there really good studies out there to say, well, if we give you estrogen and we give you progesterone, are you going to be normal weight? Um, no, we don't really have those studies, but what we do know is women who are on like bioidentical hormones, um, many of them will feel better on them, which can roll into helping them not be so prone to food, you know, negative food cues, help them exercise and just help them feel better about themselves. And the same goes for men too, right? There are some men out there where being on testosterone can help. But again, there's a lot of natural things you want to do beforehand. Resistance training helps elevate testosterone in men. Resistance training in women helps optimize sex hormones in women. So when I see people like all they're doing is running, I want to change that around. It's not that I'm against running or going out. And if you like that, that's great. But I want it to be done in such a way that it's not an added stress to the body. I want it to be more anabolic in nature than more catabolic in nature. But, you know, with metabolic effect, we have a whole a whole program on that stuff. And, you know, there's certain supplements that can help and all that. But really it's about, okay, what is the lifestyle stuff that we can do that can help you. And, and here's the other thing I also tell, <laughs> I also tell women, because a lot of women have it in their head that they'll never get their 30-year-old or 20-year-old body back. That's false. That's false. I, I know. Now, I know a lot of genetics play a role in that, but I've had plenty of women middle age 
who still have that hourglass hourglass figure and the same with men where they lose where they can lose that gut and yes with age your body doesn't work as efficiently in all areas and that it's also you know with the you know maintaining your lean mass but it can it can be done and really it's about if i can optimize their health guess what hormones will start coming back into balance mm -hmm. so yeah maybe you know if i can make sure your adrenals are not stressed where they can take over your ovaries or, or get them on board a little bit more you know, that's going to help, right? If you're living a stressful life and you're having terrible hot flashes, if we can help your adrenals and get them back online, you may not need to go on hormones, you know, it's stuff like that. So. Yeah. Nice. Nice. Okay. Um, so another, another thing I wanted to ask you about then is um, detoxification and weight loss. How, how <laughs> it's probably a, Okay. complex topic we could talk for an hour on that or oh yeah i mean we could talk right. we could talk forever but i mean yeah. in, in a nutshell i tell people this i just tell that um you know getting the excess weight off of you especially visceral fat is is a form of detox so the two i think go hand in hand so if you are trying to get weight off of you in essence you're also you're also going to detox also go on a detox. However, I will say this, most people think of detoxes as, okay, I need to take a pill or a drink or, you know, a magic potion or greens drink or whatever. And, and then I'll detox. But the best way to detox is through avoidance. And what I mean by that is, you know, it can be as simple as making sure you open the windows in your house. It could be as simple as making sure that you change the air filters in your home. It's as simple as making sure that you're, you know, you're not drinking out of or micro hot plastic or microwaving in plastic. And, you know, I know a lot of people have probably heard this, but, but the research is there and there's associations of these chemicals will inhibit, uh, will inhibit fat loss. So the more you can avoid these chemicals, the more your body is going to be better able to drop weight. And, and this speaks to the fact of some of these very high fat diets, like a ketogenic diet, Yes, it is better, and it, this may be splitting hairs because if you're, if you're doing all those other things, it may not matter. But if you're eating a high-fat diet and you're eating meat that's full of hormones and stuff like that, that may be one thing that's inhibiting weight loss. But on the therapeutic order of things, if everything else is right and you're eating steak and you don't know where it came from, whether it's hormone-laden you know, laden steak or pesticide-laden vegetables – I don't think it's going to cause any problem in your weight loss with a ketogenic diet. So, you know, it may be splitting hairs, but a lot of these high fat diets, you know, that's one, that's one avenue of where toxicants can get into your body. But I, before I even worry about that, I'd worry about the avoidance issue first. So air purifiers, you know, optimizing your own body's endogenous detoxification. Are you pooping? Are you sweating? Are you drinking plenty of water? Are you getting fresh air in your home? You know, are you getting out in the fresh air? Um, all those things first. Are you applying cosmetics or anything on your skin that can inhibit fat loss? You know, so those things we look at first. Um, and then my favorite fat loss supplement and favorite detox supplement, like I said before, is fiber. You know, okay. we, can always, we can always increase um, our, our fiber um, in our diets and and that goes a long way to helping your gut bugs help you detox and and helping bind things so you get rid of them so really think about detox as optimizing your own endogenous detoxification systems and not so much taking something yeah nice nice um all right we talked about that so so what kind of forms of exercise? I mean, you, you mentioned just the daily activity things and maybe even sitting in your chair and fidgeting. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, yeah, what, yeah. what type of form and resistance training is on your list, but what other types of exercise do you consider um, good, healthy forms of exercise that aren't going to cause excessive stress in, in the body? Um, I, I, well, the best form of exercise uh, – really is something somebody's going to do right but again you want to think about exercise in context so if you if you are exercising to help your bones probably the worst thing you can do for that is swim you know that's like that's that's analogous to space environment you know you're not having gravity work on your bones so swimming's not great one for for uh bone for bone health you know um if you're if if you want to uh 
boost up your cardiovascular fitness, you know, probably the best form of exercise to do is a, is aerobic type exercise. Um, but I think the best overall type of exercise where you can also get a good aerobic workout with it is more of the resistance form of exercise. But it only really comes down to what people are going to do and what they're going to be consistent with and what they're going to do without injuring their self, themselves. So we give home workouts without equipment, you know, so, you know, we just meet the people where they are. And there's some very effective workouts out there that will help people just do their own thing in their house. But one very effective form of exercise, the research is phenomenal on this, is just five minutes a day has shown benefit. So you can do a minute of squats at your desk after working an hour and sit down and go back to work and do a burst. And then in another hour, get up, do a minute of squats and, you know, do five, five sets of that. That's five minutes of working out and you're working it in, in with your work schedule. And the research is really cool on this because it also shows when you do that, you tend to be more productive. Oh, yeah, <laughs> I was just thinking work. about that because just getting that extra blood flowing, some of it's going to get up there to your more, brain. It's more productive and it breaks up the monotony of the day. So I really like burst training. And, and then once you said, all right, I did my three to five sets of squats, now I'm going to do lunges in place. And you do a lunge and you get in that range of motion that hurts the most. You can take your phone and put a timer on one minute do the next leg one minute or just do one minute, get sit down, do some work. And then the next time you do it, do the other leg. Yeah. You know, push ups one minute, you do them off the wall. If you're not, if you can't do them off the floor, you do them off the knees, off a table. So there's, there's so many ways to incorporate exercise in your lifestyle and you don't, you don't need a gym and the burst training really fits in well in our time starved, you know, life. Yeah. Right. Awesome. So I love I really that. Love. I got to add that into my life today. <laughs> as you're talking about this i'm like why am i not even doing that i work at my desk all day long like this right. is so yeah, great it, it yeah. helps and it doesn't have to be a minute you know i like to do it to where you get a burn so it could be 30 seconds you know or yeah. you can or you can sit in a squat position and pulse there till you get a burn and then you're done and then do another set later but all that all that works and the reason why exercise is so important as i said before is throughout history you know, we're getting more and more sedentary. So we have to make sure that we move and the burst training is a great way to get it in there. And it's a great way to be more productive at work. And the, the, again, more, we talk about productivity, but it also, if you're an entrepreneur like me and you are, what, what happens is it, it spikes your creativity centers too over time. So exercise does that. And then the great thing that most of your listeners really like is just doing that over time. Once it becomes a habit, once it becomes you know, where, where you, you have to exercise or you do it out of habit or you're moving out of habit, what it shows is that you are going to be, you're going to be much more resistant to fat gain and that weight thermostat will not go up. It will not go up and it may even tend down. Nice. So, yeah. So those are, those are generally what I'll, what I'll tell people. And it just depends on what they enjoy and what they're trying to get out of the exercise. Yeah, that's, that's really great. And it's one of the things it's right in alignment with, I, with I, what I recommend to my clients is do what you want to do. What, do what you love to do. Do what feels yeah. good to you. And it may be something different than what you've thought in the past because so many people get the idea like, well, I have to go to the gym. And right. it really doesn't even have to be that way. So, well, And here's the thing about that, right? We talk about, re, you know, um, if food is out of the way, it's hard to eat. You know, if it's like mm -hmm. sitting behind something you don't see, it's hard to eat. Or if you have to reach up for it. Well, it's the same thing with the gym. You know, if you have if you know that you can do a good workout at home without equipment and we give these workouts to our clients all the time, mm -hmm. then you don't need to go to the gym. It's right there in your home. Or if you, if you go to work and you see your gym shorts and shoes right on your car seat, when you get in your car to go home, that's a cue to go to the gym, you know? So it's using these, these nudging mechanisms to keep you from eating. Right. So, and then also help you work out, you know, or, or, or stay active. Nice. Nice. Just give me an idea. I'm going to, I'm going to do a challenge in my, we have a Facebook group for my program members and I'm going to do a challenge where I'm going to go record a video in there when we're done of, and say, <laughs> here's the squat challenge. Just for one minute, we're going to do something. And yes. when you see this, you have to do it too. Yeah. <laughs> and I gave people it to to make a snowball effect where they post their own and every time they see it, they've got to join in too. So. Right. Well, it's funny. It's just tell you a quick story. So I gave a talk in the UK. We give a talk out there a lot with uh, talking about diet and stuff. Well, my, my talk was on exercise and brain health, but 
I didn't, I didn't have a chance to work out the whole, like the whole two days. So I worked out during the talk. It was an hour and a half talk. So the whole, everybody did it with me. We did a minute. I took a break. We did a minute of squats. Then we did a minute lunges. I got a whole workout in a minute, you know, an hour and a half of my talk. So everybody got a workout in the audience and I got a workout in. So I was very efficient, productive. No excuses. <laughs> no excuses. <laughs> That's right. Oh, I love that. Well, so, uh, you know, people want to get, in uh you know touch with you and get more information uh we're gonna we're gonna link this below but what's what's an easy way that they can um, um you know i'm i'm on twitter keone tita i'm on you know i'm on people can find me on facebook my i use my personal page they can find me there um uh my clinic is uh it's the metabolic health clinic but the the website is nhc nc.com so naturopathic health clinic of north carolina.com and they can okay. just call and, and if they want to get in touch with me and they can find all my information if they want to get on my newsletter they can find the information there and, and sign up for that too but um, I'm, I'm on the web they can find me if they really want to excellent so. excellent well was there anything else that you were hoping i would um ask you about or that you wanted to to share or? um I don't know. I mean, I, I, I could talk to you about just about this stuff all night. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but, um, no, I just, you know, again, I guess the main takeaway from this for, for my clients and it sounds like your clients is really that the main takeaway is, is think about health before you think about losing weight, mm. you know, that's first. And so monitor that first. And, um, you know, usually when you think about health, the weight follows. Yeah. You know, so that's great. That is, that is great. That's a great recap and, and conclusion. Too long, didn't read. Here's the, here's the short note. So, so just my final question for you then, if, if, uh, if you knew today was your last day on earth, the, the meteor was coming at us, it was going to kill us all today. What, what would your final meal be? Oh, my final meal, it'd probably be chocolate. I'd have to have chocolate in there. Um, <laughs> <laughs> it'd be chocolate by the way we could do a whole we should talk about chocolate because i know that herb inside out the aroma cacao it has lots of longevity aspects to it the problem is it's very high calorie and when you mix it with sugar it can make you gain weight but <laughs> i'd go home and probably eat a ton of chocolate and and, and uh enjoy the view of the meteor coming in okay yeah because <laughs> it's gonna be a spectacular show right it's gonna, be, it's gonna be a great show yes <laughs> that's great i love it all right well thank you so much dr keone and uh uh, thank you everyone for watching. If you've enjoyed us, give us a thumbs up and subscribe if you want to see more of these. We've got more uh, interviews coming. So right. thanks for watching. Uh, we'll see you next Carol. time. Bye. Bye everybody. Bye.